All right. So when I was growing up, my dad, uh, as kind of maybe you guys had dads like this, but my dad was like the guy that would tell any, say anything he had to say, tell any story he had to tell to get whatever it is he wanted. So uh, if we were on an airplane flight or whatever, he would, we would walk up and I'd be so embarrassed and my dad would make up some story about how I was like sick or had some sort of crazy disease and why we needed first class. Uh, or why we need to go in the Admirals Club, or why we needed to do just, I mean, it was just weird, and I was just, I'd always get like, oh, no, I would cringe whenever my dad would kind of take me anywhere, and um, and then the other half of my dad was that when when I would turn to a teenager, I just remember, why is my dad teaching me how to shave, and I know that sounds like a weird thing to be really overly concerned about, because it's not really that hard to figure out, but I think I had like this dream of my dad being the guy that would teach me all the things that I was supposed to know about being a man. And if there's one thing I knew you weren't supposed to do, it was one lie. And the other thing you were kind of supposed to teach, you were supposed to teach me was like how to, to shave. And so I felt when I grew up, all of a sudden, I, I never felt like, and this might be a weird thing to say, I never felt like I had become a man until uh, I had gone and done some really difficult things in the army. And then I could kind of look back and I was like, well, that's what a man does. He does really, really impossible, hard things. And I would try and do more, more, more really, really hard things to kind of just prove myself uh, to myself and maybe to other people to say, like, someone's got to validate me. Someone's got to tell me I'm a man. And because here it is. Every one of us, all, all of us, we would say, I want to be a man, but there's something wrong with our society and our culture that has taken us away from being we have just no clue like we if you were to take down any you know a kid and sit them down like what does it mean to be a man they might say have a job and we're gonna get into what that doesn't mean but nobody's gonna say like i don't know maybe old i mean the reality is that we have so many kids walking around in our culture today, that are in grown-up bodies. And something's wrong with that. And so I want to, so this morning, if you guys have your little sheet, you guys have your little sheets? So we're going to be walking through those. Uh, I'm going to kind of start off with some presuppositions, which is going to drive um, our entire, <laughs> awesome. It's, it's just great when people like totally miss the whole handout section. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there are some presuppositions that drive um, what it is that it is to be a man, and here's what I just want to kind of walk us through, is that manhood, I might need some help, is in a state of confusion, all right? We have experienced the feminization of, of our society. In fact, there's kind of like two views. One is uh, that all, all boys and girls are essentially the same. It's just society has kind of like, you know, Boys grow up with guns and, uh, you know, sports, and girls grow up with Barbies and cooking. And that's been kind of, like, socialized into us, and that's why, uh, you know, that's why boys are like boys are, and that's how girls are like girls are. And there's no difference between boys and girls. And that's what a lot of us have been taught. Uh, the, the one that probably just kind of, I don't know if it cracks me up or makes me sad, in California, there's, like, the transgendered children law. Like, if you don't want to be a boy, you can be a girl and go to the girl's bathroom. That is law in California right now today in school. So if I don't want to go to a, a boy's bathroom and I feel like today I'm a girl, uh, I can go walk into a girl's bathroom. That is law in California right now. And you start of wondering, right, is, what's the reality here? Is that um, what happened? What happened? And, and I, I'm here. I, my thought is that I, I, I believe, and as I kind of look over God's word, there is a kind of a male operating system. There is a male operating system that God has imprinted on us, and we operate best when operating in our operating system. And there is a female operating system. It's like PC and Mac. You can't, you know, you can't operate. A PC from a Mac, unless you get parallels, and that's another story. All right, anyway, so like, but there, there is, they, they just don't, they're their own operating system. When we try and take something that's out of its own operating system, it destroys it. It's not, it's not made for that. In fact, um, probably 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago maybe, it, the, the common catchphrase, we need, men need to get in touch with their feminine side. 
Like that was an entire agenda to demasculinize men. And we bought it. We bought it. And partly, okay, and the first reason is because of the societal revolution. Here, here's what happened. Back in the old days, um, and when I say old days, I mean pre-1800s old days, okay? All, all men, essentially most men, grew up on a farm. And so a, a boy spent most of his day with his dad. Like, you know, working alongside his dad. I mean, he at eight, nine, ten years old. I mean, he wouldn't know much, but he knew that, like, you know, how to bale hay or how to feed a goat or, you know, whatever it was. And he could, you know, build things with his dad. And he would watch his dad. And there, there wouldn't be any, there was, like, this sense of, like, manhood was learned side by side, day by day. And since the, kind of the Industrial Revolution... You know, changed our society and men were no longer around boys for tw- up to 12, 16 hours a day. And that is what started the change in men not really knowing how to be men because they had no fathers to teach them. So all they had to look up to was mom. And so we started to see a, 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 a process where men started to lose their manhood. All right. And, and so how about this? The spiritual revolution. Um, uh, Pre-Darwin, it, it was anti-intellectual. It was anti-intellectual to say there was no God. Like someone say, like, I don't really believe in God. Like, You're an idiot. What? How could you? What? What? How did all this get here? And that, I mean, that's where you would start with that. And so everyone, nobody prior to kind of the Darwinian like thought process thought that, I mean, nobody like... Um, sane or intellectual at all would ever give any credence to a thought that there was no God. But with Darwin came an explanation for um, how life came about. And so we could get away with um, not having a God. In fact, we could look at dolphins and wolves to kind of see like how they operate in, you know, as, as in life and in society and in their own sort of species and say like, oh, well, that's how we must interact. And we started to look at animals and wildlife and start to determine our own view of ourselves. It's really weird. Okay, then, thirdly, there was the social revolution. And and what probably started out was a really good thing. Equal um, pay for equal work for women, for voting rights for women. A lot of awesome stuff had an ideology behind it that... Uh, there was no difference between what a man and woman could do. Kind of like the operating systems were no different. It's just the same kind of deal. And so if you try, you are trying to hold a woman down by telling her that she has a certain role or that a man is, you're trying to elevate him in society uh, to, um, to totally like ruin or hold down or oppress. This thing of oppression was big. And so we're still reeling from that. We are still reeling from the effects of all these things, right? So men, I mean, like, you don't, you know, it wasn't big, like, difficult thing in Jesus' day uh, for men to be men because all you learned from the get-go was how to be a man. And women were just this, they were beautiful, they were uh, a thing that was, like, you know, weird, you didn't really get to know them very well, it, just because you just didn't hang around women. And so you'd fall in love, and that was it at 16 or 17. And then you learn the rest of your life how to love that woman. All right, so that brings us to my uh, second uh, presupposition, which is that confused men create major problems. Let's just check out um, a couple uh, stats here. 90% of murders are committed by men. Uh, 85% of robberies are committed by men. 81% of violent crimes are committed by men. 78% of rape committed by men. I'm not going to go there. Uh, 77% of assaults are committed by men. Now, this is where people look at men and they're like, they are um, worthless human beings. What, look, at, look at all the stats. And this is where and the, kind of the feminist drive is like, well, men are so bad, we need to take them, kind of de-escalate their kind of influence in society. But here's what uh, anthrop- anthropologists, like people who study people. Uh, in fact, check this next, this person right here. Like, this is like, um, arch enemy of all Christians, but, uh, and she was one of the, the main drivers to say it's, it's society that is, um, 
pushing men to be, or that, that pushes anyone to be a man or anyone to be a woman, if that simply kind of took out that um, societal influence, you would have just people being people. And she said the central problem for any society is to find appropriate roles for men. I mean, like, you look at any, listen, before clean drinking water, uh, before um, resources for food, before any of that, the most important thing for any society is to find an appropriate role for men. Okay, how about this? Look, this next thing. This is what Newsweek from 2006 said. One of the most reliable predictors of whether a boy will succeed or fail in high school rests on a single question. Does he have a man to look up to? This is Newsweek. This isn't like, you know, you know Christianity Today. This is Newsweek. Too often the answer is no. High rates of divorce and single motherhood have created a generation of fatherless boys. And I'm not talking about... Um, like not having a bio dad. I think all of us have bio dads. But what I'm talking about is having somebody that was not involved in your life. And we have a fatherless generation. Even though I, have a, I had a biological dad up until last year. And I love my dad. And, you know, awesome. He, he checked out during the, probably the most important years of the teenage years. And I would be willing to bet that a lot of you have come through that same place of having a dad that might have not exactly been in the midst and there's a part of you that feels fatherless somebody needs to teach me how it is to be a man all right here's my my next presupposition is that confused men settle for less all right confused men settle for less here's the first one is this is that we have one dimensional manhood one dimensional manhood is um it, it, it always comes to the effect of when i ask you a question i go so what do you do and and, and, and this, is, this is normal, but every one of our response is our one thing that we do is our career and our job. And, one, and this has kind of like been the historic conventional, like where men go whenever they want to um, kind of focus on their, them or their lives or improving. It's all about the career. I mean, it's all about what are you going to do? What do you do? And then we kind of look around the, the, the class or we look around our peers and we kind of validate ourselves or validate our own position based on how everybody else is doing. And so there's a part of me that, that I feel good about myself when I am doing better than my peers are, or I feel a sense of worthlessness and purposelessness, which drives me into insignificance whenever I don't measure up. And this is why in a lot of guys in their 40s, maybe almost 50s, they're, they're taking, and a lot of them, I, I can just have a, a relative of mine does He's taking his compensation plan for his job. He's 50 years old. He's like, Dad, is it good enough? Or the, the crisis hits and there's no one to show is it good enough. And so there's, they kind of look at TV and celebrity. And that's why you get the ridiculous car at 45. And you're just like, I ho- and maybe I can get divorced and trade in, you know, mom of my kids for 22-year-old hottie. And let's kind of get life moving again. That's the one-dimensional Manhood, and here's the second one uh, that is, have confused men selling for less. It's delayed manhood. Like, here's what's happening to our young adults. They are longer and longer and longer holding on to have their parents support them, right? I mean, this is just the reality. That we have, um, I mean, it's normal, right? It's normal for 26-year-olds to be on their parents' insurance. Are you serious? How did that happen? I mean, there was a time where it was like at 18, you're done, right? You're, 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 I'm cutting you off the cell phone plan. I'm cut, but the reality for a lot of us is that we have like, there's this kind of like a, the gap year. You guys familiar with the gap year term? That's like the, the year between uh, your parents either finish paying off for college or you finish living with them. And then you just, you get a year to chill. Because, I mean, your life has been so hard and you just need to take a break because college, you know, and all the parties and or high school, and just like all the, you know, it was really intense, hard work, and you don't know how you're ever going to do it, and you just need a, a year. And so you go off to Europe, or you go to Colorado, or you go to Pflugerville, and you're going to go and just chill out and just kind of let everything settle for a full year while you get adjusted to real life. And then you're going to go start looking for a job. 
And then here's what happens with delayed manhood is that in, in our, we have this vision of like, um, you know, we've seen success stories and you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. And that's ridiculous. You can't. Nobody here is going to be in the NBA except maybe Ed. We're still, you know, it's still out on that one. I don't know. I mean, like the, the reality is that nobody's going to, you, you can't be anything you want to be. You can't. But we bought into that crazy lie that you could be anything you want to be. And so here's what people do. They delay getting an actual job because they're waiting for the offer from like the, you know, from the Chicago Bulls or the Dallas Mavericks or the Spurs. They're going to call me up at any point. And so I just got to be ready and I want to get a real job until then. So I'm going to wait until that perfect job comes along. That's what we do. That's what we do. I right, hit the next one. And so we have no lofty vision of manhood that is compelling to men today. Can we, can we all kind of agree to that? Uh, there's nothing that's sitting here going like, you know, man. In fact, if you were to say, sit down, it's like, what is it to be a man? If, and if like the response is telling stories about how high school was and how like, man, how it's tough being a man now. Because I, I remember when it used to be. Uh, the party, and it used to be the fun times, and it used to be, and there's no kind of like this dedication to responsibility. There's no vision of manhood that's compelling. So, and I'm, we're going to start kind of getting there, but um, manhood is about taking on responsibility. This is how I'm going to act. I won't have mama paying my bills. There's going to be this kind of this progression of more responsibility taken on for to provide for, to take care of, to own your part of what it is to be a man. And next one, the Bible has inside answers to all of the above. And so um, I want us to take a look here real quick. We're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. All right, love is patient and kind. And you're like, what? This is like a chick verse. No, watch. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. And as for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes... The partial will pass away. When I was a child, now watch this. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. It's time to give up the childish ways of our past. Because here it is. When you were younger, you weren't patient. Like Austin, my son, is not patient. When he is hungry, he knows how to say more. And he goes like this. That means more in baby sign language. Or he'll just scream. And there is no, it, there is no uh, difference between any of that. All right? There's nothing. And so here's what happens. We've got unfinished business of our past. And here's what a lot of, me will, a lot of you will tell me is that, Chris, you don't understand. And this, again, I do marriage counseling all the time. You don't understand. I can't help it. That's the way I was raised. Now listen to me. I don't want to be like the bearer of bad news, but you can't keep using that excuse. Like as men, we've got to step up and say like there, that my, there is something that explains my past, but it does not excuse my past. And there is stuff that we're going to be going through for the next 11 weeks after well, 12 weeks total. We're, next 12 weeks about unpacking some of the pain of your past and sort of sorting through it so that we can walk forward and like get past that. Understand that, he get healing from that, and then look forward to what God has for us. Because here's what it's going to look, look watch this next verse. For now we see in uh, a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I had no in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And what I'm hoping for is that we will be fully known. That's like the hardest thing for men. We don't want to be fully known. And he's, he's talking about here a point of, of coming to be fully known by Christ. And, but there's this reality that here on earth, there's a sense that we need to be fully known here, which is why we're going to be breaking into small groups, which is why I'm hoping and praying that these groups don't just stick for the summer, that they kind of last beyond the summer, that guys are going to want to get to know each other deeper and deeper and deeper. Because being fully known is huge. Hit this next one. 
And we need a clear and compelling definition to direct our future. Guys, I want you to be setting the standard for what it is to be a man. And again, we've got 12 weeks to figure this thing out, and we're going to be doing another 12 weeks next year, so we've got a while. But I want us to kind of get this compelling vision of a future so that when young men come up to us who have no father, and we can say, listen, this is what men do. I want that to be kind of, kind of our mantra. No, this is what men do. Men take responsibility. They're not passive. They're active. Men uh, take care of their families. Men are, have self-control. You know, there's so many, there's not very many verses about women like trying to resist men. It's all about men trying to resist women. Did you know that? Because if a man, a man in our society is not neutral, if he can control himself, if he can be a force for good, that society is going to be awesome. And I'm not just trying to make a great society. What I'm trying to do is have godly men who are infused by the Holy Spirit. Because you, unless you're infused by the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to be a godly man. It's I'd say, dare say, impossible to have the responsibility to do what God has called us to do without the Holy Spirit within us. So here's the question I have for you guys. Are you willing to define manhood for yourself and the next generation? And so this morning, we're going to start to break out into groups, and Ron's going to come back up here, and he'll kind of like direct you in how that's all going to work. But as we kind of go into our small groups, I want you to be thinking about that specifically. So pray with me. God. Thank you uh, for allowing us to be in the midst of your presence here. God, I'm praying that your grace and your mercy would be right here. Jesus, um, we have watched um, our society just kind of fall apart on itself. And God, we do need a vision for something bigger and better. And so God, I'm praying that you would do more than we could ever hope for or ask. And I'm praying that as these men uh, just kind of get to know one another, they ask questions that you've Uh, put uh, on our hearts just through this small group uh, discussion material, that, God, we would cast a vision of manhood which would be greater than we could ever hope or ask. We love you, Jesus. It's all for your glory. Amen.